This is R.J. Rushduni, Easy Chair Number 226, August 24, 1990. Otto Scott and I are discussing education and related matters with Samuel Blumenfeld. I'd like to start off uh, by continuing on a vein that we were discussing at the end of the previous tape. About ten years ago, there were two or three lawyers in the country who were very much interested in finding parents whose children were functional illiterates. Their idea was it's time to challenge the public school system by having a series of malpractice trials from coast to coast. Parents charging the teachers in the school and any responsible agency, including the states, for their uh, children's illiteracy. Now, their feeling was that these trials would result in defeat in most cases, but that if they continued them in one state after another, they would finally find a judge whose grandchildren or children were functional illiterates and who was ready to recognize that there was a liability here. Uh -huh. And once such a case stood up in court, then it would be hard with that precedent set to rule against it. It would be dangerous for a judge to do so. The ideal case would be of a minority uh, family's child, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps black. The trouble was they didn't find anyone interested. But the situation is still a valid one. Oh, absolutely. And it would be a good thing to talk to some black pastors in the course of your travels to call this fact to their attention that there's a great potential here that will revolutionize the situation because it will be a precedent of far-reaching consequences. Well, it's a, a Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. What we have here, what has developed, and you recall that I once wrote about it, uh, New Crimes, mm -hmm. I called it. We have a professional class, various professions, who, in effect, are doing to people what was once considered criminal acts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are uh, luring them into situations, for instance, psychologists can lie as an experimental matter just to see what the in how the individual reacts. And this is, of course, a form of fraud. They put people into a great emotional state and then, well, ha-ha, it's simply to provide a paper or a survey or a study. We have educators who do not educate. We have, for that matter, judges who do not judge. We have a whole governing class that is betraying the people and the trust that the people have in it. And if, and if as you say, Sam, if these methods are actually creating brain damage, the question wouldn't be to bring in a minority particularly, in my point of view, it would be to bring in somebody from the best of circumstances who had been brain damaged as a test case. And this is not, because this should not be a sympathetic matter. It shouldn't be a racial matter. It should be, here is a fellow who has a excellent heredity, who's IQ as an infant was extraordinarily well, and here he is a functional illiterate after paying a great deal of money for yes. a bad education. Yes. Sam, uh, in talking to the uh, Cal Seton Christian school teachers Wednesday morning, you pointed out how bad it is to teach the child to print yes. rather than to... Uh, Right. Learn cursive writing, and it establishes wrong muscular patterns. 
What is not commonly recognized is that uh, those patterns are set very early and endure. Yes. That if they do not learn how to write early, they never do. One of the classic examples of that is of a man who was quite learned, but is often described by some historians as uh, illiterate because he could not sign his name. Who was that? Charlemagne. Uh huh. Well, Charlemagne was quite literate, but he had never learned to write. Uh huh. So it was with difficulty he could sign anything. Yes. Or make a mark in a hurry. Now, this uh, has been used, the fact of his difficulty in writing, in fact his virtual inability, to say that here was an illiterate man, but he was a man who brought a scholar to the court, a man who read uh, works in Latin, mm -hmm. a man who would take things uh, with him on trips in order to study them, but he could not write. Certain patterns, if they are not set in the brain as a child, are never properly yes. set. Yes. That's why to learn a language at 60 is difficult. At 6, no problem. No problem. No problem. Exactly, and... and uh, our primary schools in this country do such a poor job that millions come out come out of our schools unable to read and write, to cipher, or you know even to speak English correctly, or uh, even think. And uh, incidentally, uh, Rush, there have been several cases, you know, concerning functional literacy. There was one in San Francisco in the 70s. And the judge ruled that the schools had no uh, responsibility to teach a child to read, that their sole responsibility was custodial. Really? Yes. And this was a judge? This was a judge, and that was the ruling in the San Francisco and case. That should follow him everywhere he goes. Uh -huh. Then there was another case in New York State where the judge again ruled against the, the parents because they said, well, the parents had recourse to the school administration and they should have complained to the school administration. Uh -huh. And they also said that the court is not in a position to be able to judge what is educational malpractice. So only I educators think. can do that. I suppose. But, uh, uh, but as, as uh, Russia suggested, certainly uh, one must keep trying. Yeah, well, must, you, could uh, get, you could get physiologists, and you could get educators. There are uh, outlaw educators. <laughs> yes who uh, are well aware of what's going on. Yes. Well, I talked with the attorney once who was responsible for uh, the defense of the flag-burning uh, student rebels of the 60s. Uh-huh. Uh, subsequently, he became a Christian. A very remarkable man, a professor of law. And they lost case after case of flag-burning. But finally they found a judge who was ready to agree with them that this was a matter of civil liberty. Now, to undo the damage, uh, some have proposed a constitutional amendment because it's a matter of it case would, law now. It would be yes. simpler to change the judiciary. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's going to take... Uh, it's been very difficult. I've spoken all over the country and I occasionally meet somebody who was seriously uh, damaged, disabled by the uh, system, and they become interested in a lawsuit, but then it never, there's never any follow-up because it's hard to find a lawyer who yes. understands what all of this about uh, this is about, and and uh, a lawyers also want money up front for these cases uh, because they're very problematical. Uh, I, I have proposed that instead of of suing the schools or the uh, uh, the administration or, or the teachers that they sue the publishers of the works. In other words, if the publishers are producing a product that is damaging, well, hurting these uh, hurting these youngsters, and then the uh, then 
as free enterprises, as profit makers, they have deeper pockets in a sense, as far as the court is concerned. In other words, there's less sympathy. Well, there is certainly. There's less sympathy for a profit making publisher who has well, made a lot true. of money on this. For example, there's the company that produced Dick and Jane has made millions, even That's though they've managed to also destroy uh, a couple of million lives in, in, the, in the process. That's true, but in fact, the publishers merely relay what uh, the educators oh, have yeah, what produced. The, yes. and but I remember said, Agent Orange, that Monsanto was held, was yes, considered. Yes. Not deep, the government who used it. Yes, deep pockets in that right. case. And uh, we have all these erring politicians who preside over these terrible situations and give wonderful speeches and are never held responsible. The whole business of not holding people responsible has become an American ingrained habit. Practically no one is held responsible. You, you mentioned earlier that the kids are passed on without passing an examination. They can't even fail. The only thing is that they come out as morons. But I can't forget that the early days of the Reformation, really in England, the downfall of the monarchy, uh, culminating in the execution of Charles I, began when men began to talk, stand up and talk to the Court of High Commission and to the Court of Common Pleas about maladministration yeah. and malpractice by government. And it's somebody has to start it because before it's over, it becomes an avalanche. Well, it, it certainly should be done in our society, which Very is definitely. supposedly, you know, a democratic society, yes. uh, which yes. is rife with uh, maladministration across the board and, and malpractice. But uh, well, uh, speaking of malpractice, why not tell our listeners some of the kinds of malpractice? with a starting student, a well, child going to school for the first time. What are some of the things that are done to that child that are wrong? Well, the first thing they do is, is when they teach the child uh, supposedly to read, mm. is that they, well, they will sometimes, they will teach the alphabet, but then they do not teach the alphabet sounds. They don't teach the sounds the letters stand for. And they teach the child a sight vocabulary. Now, a sight vocabulary, by definition, is teaching children to look at each English word as if we're in a Chinese ideograph, a little picture, you see. So the child gets the impression that written language is a series of little pictures. In other words, and, and that the letters have no meaning at all. So this idea is being put in his head to begin with. Then, of course... He has to look at each word and try to see something in the word that will uh, convey its meaning to him. And therefore he'll look at the word from left to right, right to left, center outward. Uh, usually the teacher will start by, by teaching a the configuration clue. She'll put a little frame around the word. Say, for example, the word horse. She'll put a frame around the word horse and she'll tell the child, see the little horse? Now, you and I know that H-O-R-S-E doesn't look like a horse. Doesn't even sound like one. So how, so how does a child see a horse in that frame? You know, huh? Any way he can, you see. Could be the O, could be the R, could be the H. Who knows? Well, then uh, they realize that that's not quite enough. So they also provide picture clues. That's why these books have lavish colored pictures. They have lots of pictures of horses, so the child will conclude that the word must be horse, you know. Now, you can't always have pictures of horses every time you, you uh, use the word horse. They've got other things to illustrate, so they provide what they call uh, context clues. They'll give the child a sentence such as, the, uh, the man put the saddle on the, and the child will think, well, it could be a donkey, it could be a camel, but it's probably a horse, you see. So you're going back to the Egyptian... Yes, the Chinese, Chinese ideographs. Now... Uh, they realized that to reduce the ridiculousness of the guessing, because kids, the kids can make some ter terrific, crazy guesses, they also teach what they call phonetic clues. Now, here's where things get sticky, because if you go to any primary school in America and ask them, uh, ask the teachers, do you teach phonics, they will all say yes. 
but they're not teaching intensive systematic phonics. They're not teaching the letters before they read the words. What they are doing is simply telling the child that if you see the letter H, you know at, at the beginning of the word, you know it couldn't possibly be banana or baloney, but it could be house, hotel, hovel, hearse, or horse. So that reduces the, the parameters of the, uh, of the guessing. Now, the leading professor of reading in the United States, Dr. Kenneth Goodman, calls reading a psycholinguistic guessing game. And he told a reporter from the New York Times that if the child sees the word horse and says pony, that's correct. That's correct. If and the child sees the word father and says dad, that's correct. Yeah, we call him the Smith, picture. it would be correct. <laughs> but you can see that that produces inaccurate uh, highly uh, incompetent readers. Uh, you better not put that person in charge of a contract. Well, that switches them into graphics, doesn't it? Yes, uh, of course. And John Dewey said that the chief method of learning is through the image, not through the word. You graphics see. again. So uh, th there you are. You've you, you destroyed this ch child's ability to learn to read because once you have, you have p made him a guesser, a word guesser, and for the next two years, he's reading and guessing as he goes along and reading words backwards or upside down and reversing letters. Do you know how difficult it is to undo that damage? Do you know how difficult? I have tried to train young people. It takes years, years, because most of them are not even aware of the errors they make. You know how the typical look, say, reader reads? He'll read along rather quickly. He'll leave out a word that's there. He'll put in a word that isn't there. He'll truncate words. He sees a word like telephone, and he says phone. The word says newspaper. He says paper. Uh, if he sees a multisyllabic word that he doesn't can't figure out, he'll just skip it. Mm. Uh, he'll guess at words that he's never seen before. He makes all sorts of errors that he's not aware of, and then he doesn't understand what he's read. Now, is there any wonder that he has poor comprehension, you see, and finds that the written word has nothing of interest for him? So why should he learn to read? And, and I'll tell you, this method of teaching creates such psychic pain that I was, that a man told me, this was a, a millionaire, a, a highly successful restaurateur in Boston, who I was tutoring, who told me that he would rather be beaten than have to read, that it was that psychically painful. And that struck home to me. I realized then what damage this method does to people, and yet he was a very successful man. It didn't it, it didn't interfere with his self esteem. His wife did the reading for him, or a good secretary, or a word processor. But he knew that he couldn't read. Yes, yeah, right? some years ago, I not too many years ago, I think in the seventies, latter part perhaps, I gave a series of lectures at the request of the army, the country's largest army base in North, uh, South Carolina. And I learned that one of the greatest expenses that the army incurs is from equipment that is destroyed by soldiers who cannot read directions. Now, they may at the Pentagon sometimes pay a thousand dollars for a hammer or some such foolish thing all of which is wrong. But the big waste that comes in from seriously damaged equipment, multi-million dollar equipment, by a man who cannot read properly is never reported to us. Now the Army does educate when it finds out a student or a recruit cannot read. Uh, all the recruits and tries to teach those who fail to pass any uh, minimal standard how to read. But even then, so many get by, and it is a constant cause of serious trouble because today the equipment the Army has in the hands of all men is high-priced right. equipment very costly and easily destroyed by a person who cannot read directions or follow 
uh, directions when given to him. Yes. Well, I know a great many men who do not read outside of business. They read memorandums. They read reports. They're very poor at letters. It was our father's generation that lived by letters. Telephone calls and letters. They'd, they'd make a deal over the phone and they'd write a letter. And it would be very specific and loaded with detail. But I don't get any letters anymore. I get telephone calls. Yes. I don't know hardly anyone in business who sends a letter, excepting, of course, at the culmination where you get a contract that a lawyer has drawn up, which neither of the principals can understand. Yes. But uh, many of the men that I know consider reading off the job a waste of time. Yes. They don't enjoy it, you see. A, a look-say reader does not enjoy reading because it's much too difficult for them, so they don't read for pleasure. If you want to, it's so easy to spot a look-say reader by just knowing if they don't read for pleasure, then they, they, they've been taught by look-say. I recently got a letter from a, from a very um, um, well-appointed um, individual in England, the owner of his own company, who had read something that I had written on dyslexia, on how it's, mm -hmm. how it's induced mm -hmm. by, by uh, miseducation. And he counted himself as one of the victims. And he explained that all of the symptoms that he exhibited were exactly the symptoms that I had mm -hmm. written about in my article. And he asked if there was a cure, you see. So I decided to devote my next newsletter to answering his letter and showing how he could cure his own dyslexia. The most important, there were two important elements. One, he had to be motivated. He had to want to do something about it, you mm. see, because that's more important than anything. It, it could be a, a terribly uh, traumatic business of learning how to read all over again, starting mm -hmm. from grade one if, if it's a matter of self-esteem. The second point I made that he had to have patience because he had to become aware of all the errors he made. See, the problem with most of these readers is that they not, they're not aware of the errors they make. And the only way that they can become aware of them is to first uh, learn the phonetics of the language. He has to become a phonetic reader. Mm -hmm. So I told him he had to go through the entire alpha phonics system, learn the letters, all of their sounds, and then apply his new phonetic knowledge to his reading. And he had to be able to stop, and whenever he felt that he didn't understand what he was reading, to realize that he was making an error in reading, and to go back and reread it, and to do it slowly enough, word for word, so that he would not make the same error twice. I've noticed that a lot of these looks say, the youngsters do the same. They will make the same error twice. You ask them to reread it, they leave out the same word, or they put in the word that isn't there. Mm -hmm. So these are ingrained habits that have to be undone. And that's why it's so important in the primary grade, in the primary grades, those first two grades, to make sure that everything you teach the child is correct and things that they will use for the rest of their lives. And, and, that's, and when you're dealing with a mind that's five and six years old, that developing mentality and those developing skills, you've got to make sure you do it right the first time. Well, you know, reading is the only way that you can enlarge your personal information beyond experience. And everyone's experience is necessarily limited. Yes. So if all you know is what you've experienced, right. you don't know very much. One of the marks of a barbarian, and there are a number, is someone who has no sense of history. The world began with him. Yes. And now with the growing functional illiteracy, plus the, the poor teaching and lack of uh, knowledge of history, in fact, you have social studies instead of history, most of our population and most of the population of the Western world is made up of barbarians, people who have no sense of the past, no awareness of the world before their lifetime. And uh, this is a very, very uh, dangerous fact because 
especially with all the modern things like television, people can have an idealized version of how things should be. They have no sense of history, of uh, struggle, of growth, of, of the difficulty of attaining things. Yes. And you create a revolutionary population of people who believe that if you destroy things, the good automatically should come to the fore. But isn't this what happened in Rome? The barbarians destroyed Rome? And we're creating our own barbarians. We don't have to import them. Well, that's what Ortega y Gasset said. He said the, the ancients had to worry about the barbarian outside the gates. We have developed our own, what he called, vertical barbarians who rise up in our midst. Of course, what you're saying about the barbarians, Rush and, and Sam, is really more horrendous than it sounds. As, as long as you confine it to students and children, it seems remote. But the fact is, we're talking about some of the people who run the country. Yes, yes. We're talking about professionals who study history and who turn out exquisite little monographs and who confine themselves to one ten-year period and or um, men with a doctor's degree who will spend their entire life on the career of one individual he is an expert in Henry James yes and an expert in somebody else so they spend their whole lives digging in the grave of one individual from the past now, these people are not called in on policy discussions because that, those are held by practical businessmen and practical politicians. The awful point here is that these are ignorant men outside, okay. outside their yes. specialty. Incidentally, some of, you know, some of the investment bankers go to psychics and astrologers for the information. And I believe that one of the reasons why the American economy is in the state that it is is so few of them know economics. Well, they don't. So few bankers. I'll bet there, there are maybe one banker out of a hundred who's ever heard of Ludwig von Mises and who knows something about uh, uh, free market economics. Well, uh, you're being optimistic. You think one out of a hundred has heard of Ludwig von Mises. Uh, most bankers are really bookkeepers. I spoke about 1970 to a, an organization of businessmen in one area of Los Angeles, and there were perhaps six to ten bankers in the audience. And I mentioned the, the disappearance of silver from our coinage. And they were startled, these bankers. They pulled the change out of their pocket and said, what's this? And I said, look at it on the side. You'll see it's copper nature. And when some started to laugh at them, one of them said, we sit in the office, we don't deal with the money, and we're basically bookkeepers. Now, that's the kind of thing that happens and is, in fact, commonplace. Well, we have excellent skills, but they're limited. Yes. And Hannah Arendt was the one who said, the United States has many intelligent people, but it lacks conceptual thinkers. Yes. A very good point. We have, we have tactics but no strategy. We're in the Middle East wondering what our strategy is. Yes. Well, I think we do have some conceptual thinkers, but they're not in positions of, of authority or power. They're either. sitting around the state. <laughs> That's what I mean. You get the idea. Exactly. Well, of course, there's also the uh, idea that education ennobles the character and that uh, education is confined to schools. Yes. And that if you are educated, you have a piece of paper that somebody has written on it to prove. Yes, yes, that's your credential. That's right. And that's what we've been doing is, is, provi is simply providing credentials. But and we've, no proof there's been an inflation in credentials. Yes. So therefore, they are individually 
no longer accepted at face value. Yes, and of course you can get them by mail order, you know. You can I get know, I got one. I have, <laughs> I have a, a doctorate in humane letters, very elaborate, which cost me $20. I sent away for it as a joke. <laughs> Sam, why don't you define dyslexia for us? Well, dyslexia is a, is a sort of fancy word for a reading problem. I'm sure, uh, uh, Rush, you know, uh, Greek, that comes from the mm -hmm. Greek, the dis yes. means n not yes. or no, and lexia means word. So that's, it's, it's just a very nice way of saying the guy can't read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By saying he's dyslexic. That's a scientific uh, excuse right. for being unable to read. Right. Now, now, usually what happens if you're of the lower class and if you can't read, if you're functional illiterate, they believe you're stupid. Mm -hmm. But if you're in the upper class uh, or children of professional family, then you have dyslexia, you see, and that's a very fancy kind of way of... of well, every, every disability has become an illness. Yeah. Alcoholism yeah. is an illness. Uh, gluttony is an illness. Right. The seven deadly sins are all illnesses. <laughs> yes. But the point I want to make is that it is Take school... Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> the point I want to make is that it is school-induced. There is very little natural dys dyslexia. I mean, a person with half his brain blown out in a war might be dyslexic because of that... But the so-called dyslexics today are all made in the schools, and that goes not only for people in the lower classes, but you know the Rockefeller boys. Uh, three of the Rockef uh, Johnny Rockefeller's sons became dyslexic because they all went to the Lincoln School. They went to very progressive school. Didn't the they? most progressive school. Yeah, all the experiments were taking place. The Lincoln School at Columbia University, Teachers College. John D. Rockefeller Jr. gave them four million dollars and actually wanted to take advantage of the school. He put yes. four of his sons in that school. Three of them came out dyslexic. Nelson was couldn't read at all. He had mm. real problems, even though he went through Dartmouth University. Yes. Winthrop was so bad he had to drop out of Yale University. Of course, he went on to become governor of Arkansas, which only proves that even a dyslexic can become governor. Well, if you buy it. Yeah. Yes. And was and reputed uh, to have one of the biggest collections of pornography in the United really? States. Yes. And of course, and, Mal uh, and Lawrence Rockefeller also <clears throat> was dyslexic, and he bemoans the fact that reading is very, very difficult for him. Now, David went to the same school, but I don't know why... He's not among the dyslexics unless he was taught uh, privately. He might have been taught to read privately because he was the youngest and perhaps they began to catch on that oh. there was something wrong with the Lincoln School. Nelson had a low-level accent. Yes. And low-level behavior. Yes, mm -hmm. as we know <laughs> from his uh, well. marital life and his extra <clears throat> extramarital life. The most recent dyslexic of prominence is Neil Bush, the president's son. Here is someone who is only a functional, is a functional illiterate, who is made uh, the chairman of a bank and whose services are so valuable that people hand him loans of a hundred thousand or a million dollars, depending on the case, uh, for his invaluable services. I don't think he was chairman. I think he was just a director. I mean a director, uh, yeah. a member of the board of directors. Yeah. So we are increasingly, in one sphere after another, being ruled by functional illiterates. It's no wonder the country is in trouble. Yeah, these are people who don't read. In mm -hmm. other words, books... Well, they do All not right. read, and I know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never seen a country club library, <laughs> and I've been in lots of country clubs. I have, I have yet to see a country club library. Yes, you will find that young people today, you go into the homes of young people, mm -hmm. college graduates, mm -hmm. very few books. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Our generation collected libraries. Oh, yes. You know, Everyone had a, a library. Oh, you had to have. Today, there's, they've got a very small little shelf with a couple of books that they brought out from uh, the university and plus a couple of other books. But they're not book readers. 
And as you know, newspaper readership has declined in this country. Yes, and, yes. The, and the caliber of the reportage. Yeah. Uh, I was told by a student of journalism that they are told or, or trained to write at a sixth grade level. Sixth that, grade. That, uh, that y your editor will exclude any words that are... Uh, that he doesn't know, yeah. on the assumption that nobody else would know it. Right. Actually, there are very few publications in America that are highly literate. I think, for example, the New Republic still is highly literate. Commentary is highly literate. The New Yorker. But these are very small publications compared to the larger ones like Time and Newsweek. And do, do you know? And yet they are very significant. The, yeah. the Spectator from London, which you now like to read, mm -hmm. and it's a good book, has a circulation of 44,000. Mm -hmm. And London, uh, England has, what, 60,000 people, 60 million people. Mm -hmm. But that is a very significant 44,000 who read it, and they direct the others. The same thing is true of commentary. It only yes. has about 45,000 oh, circulation. Yeah, yeah. But a fellow who said to me one day, who reads? I said, people who give orders to people like you. Mm -hmm. And it's true. I don't know. I don't know. There are an awful lot of uh, functional illiterates, but they are in high CEOs places. In high places. In too. high places. There are even teachers. It who becomes are, difficult. Yeah. There's the case of the teacher in Oceanside, California, John Corcoran, who spent 18 years teaching in high school, and he was functionally illiterate. And he was able to hide it. No one knew except his wife. Even his children did not know that he couldn't read, and he was able to get a master's degree. I don't see how a person of normal intelligence, looking at all the signs and the graphics that we have today, could keep from teaching himself how to read. Well, you'd be surprised how difficult it is when you've been, uh, uh, you know, when you're when you have this idea that words are pictures. So you feel that it was putting them in the wrong path in the first place. Yes. You see, it, it, you know, uh, people assume that everybody knows what the alphabet is, yes. that it's common knowledge that the alphabet, that the letters stand for sounds. That's, that's a false assumption. Have you been in a fast food store like McDonald's of late? No, I, uh, as you, you know, I take... <laughs> I, I'm, that was I'm, a rhetorical I'm, question. I'm foreign to places like that. Well, uh, I have been once or twice... Uh, on a speaking tour, sometimes that's where it's going to take care of. Look at the cash register. Yes, they take care of it for the clerk, don't they? Yes, the cash register cash will list the various types of hamburgers, everything. Right. And you push the button for uh, a shake, uh, this type of hamburger, this type of so-and-so. Uh, uh, so Fries. From pictures. From pictures? Yes, there are pictures. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. The button will have a picture of these things. Holy smoke. So they're pushing these buttons of pictures and then tell you well, the total. They, they, can't, uh, they can't make change. They, they'll give you the bill first and then dump the change on top of the bill, which is gives you awkward handling right yes, away. Yeah. And, and they'll tell you how much your change is. They won't tell you how much you've paid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but uh, Rush, you mentioned that how, how important it is to develop these good habits, uh, teaching mm -hmm. habits. So in reading, we know that they can destroy a child's ability to learn in six months' time. Mm -hmm. Writing, they do the same thing by teaching them printing which, of course, they spend two years holding the pen straight up and down and writing straight up and down with lots of pressure. And then they're told to switch to cursive, which is a totally different, more relaxed way of writing. And most children never make the transition very well. Mm -hmm. And so they develop awful handwritings in America, whereas lots of people just print. They don't even mm -hmm. bother to learn to write. Then when it comes to arithmetic, they don't even know how to teach the basic functions in arithmetic, all they do is have the kids keep counting in ones. What do you mean in ones? Well, all they do is, you know, count little objects, you know, concretes. They don't drill them in the facts, 
you know, in the arithmetic facts, the multiplication facts, the addition facts, because that is known as rote memory. They don't teach them multiplication anymore? No, no. They, they give them calculators. They give them little, uh, you see, because rote is a no-no in American schools. You see, rote learning is for the Japanese, but not for us, you see. And uh, 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 the progressive educators simply will not tolerate rote. It doesn't so, believe in memory. Uh, well, that's it. You now, have to make up the world all new every day. All new every day. But arithmetic is a memory system. Of course. For for proficient use, it requires total memorization. Yeah, absolutely. Really you good. memorize the multiplication tables right. and you go from there. Yes. More and more students on the university level have to sit down and memorize the alphabet because otherwise they cannot use the card catalog. Yes, of course. So uh, the, the, the damage that is done in the primary schools of America is, is just incalculable. And, and what the tragedy is that here we are approaching September and another four million youngsters are entering that system. And now, in one year's time, one third of those youngsters will be permanently damaged. If you had, if you became dictator of the United States, or if you had a magic wand, as a psychologist say, what would you do with this system today? I'd send all the kids to the Chalcedon School. Well, beyond <laughs> they wouldn't be able to put in there. But well, what I would do is simply mandate. Just as you know, what happened in the Soviet Union? When Krupskaya took over, uh, Lenin's wife, yes. took over education after the Russian Revolution, right. she was so impressed by John Dewey's ideas that they adopted progressive education in the Soviet Union. Look, same method of teaching, reading, all of those wonderful activities that were going on in these little progressive yeah, schools. Reading is fun. That's right, reading is fun, learning is fun. Well, by 1932, the situation was so disastrous that the Communist Party handed down an edict throughout progressive education and reinstalled the traditional methods of teaching and, and the subject matter. And, and the curriculum was put back into its traditional subject matter. Now that was done in 1932 by edict because the Communists wanted to build a great gigantic military machine that required engineers and scientists and okay. they didn't want namby-pamby right. you know uh, progressive little kids who the were needs of the nation finally got back in their right. heads well in a dictatorship they could do that yes. you see so overnight they went back to intensive systematic phonics everybody learned to read who went to school in the Soviet Union and of course they've turned out engineers and scientists by the by the thousands. Now, of course, they were restricted in what they could read up well, to a point. But you can't. Unless they have an educated elite. And, but you can't hermetically seal a country as large as the Soviet yeah. Union. So, because these people could read, they eventually overturned this slave system. All right. That, uh, but in our country, we haven't overturned it. We're not overturning. As a matter of fact, the, the greatest form of censorship is illiteracy, isn't it? Yes. Because our people can't read. They can't read the Constitution. Well, they can't read the Declaration of Independence. How are they going to defend American freedom? Well, this is how the newspapers are censoring. They're censoring by omission. They report What they report is factual, but what they don't report is significant. Yes. And we're exposed to this from one end of the country to the other. By the way, going back to the Soviet thing, Gauthier's book on the revolution, his diary on the revolutionary period, the only diary in existence... They mm -hmm. got every other one. He was a professor at the University of Moscow, and he taught history. And history was eliminated as a subject by the Bolsheviks when they took over. Now, I believe they restored it since. Yes. But for a good long period, history was a forbidden subject. It was mm -hmm. considered unnecessary, and they used social sciences instead. You know, the interesting thing about the Soviet Union, about the communists, they believed in absolutes. Uh, and yeah. if you read their encyclopedia, they criticized John Dewey 
for being a pragmatist and for not believing in absolutes. Because they believe history, right. end quote. Of course, they believe that, you know, yeah, communism was, Marxism was scientific socialism. materialism. But yet yes. they believed in absolutes and, so yes. they, and, and were very critical of Dewey, of John Dewey. Rush, do you have anything to add to this? No, but I think you should write an article on a point you just made, which is one of the most important on the subject that I have heard. And if you would, when you go home and send it to us for right. the uh, report, you said, and I quote, the greatest censorship is illiteracy. Sure. And I think we need to say that the great enemies of uh, free speech are the public schools. They are the great censors because they are, with their functional illiterates, exercising the greatest censorship that we have had in our history. Well, Absolutely. look at the, the school administrators that wouldn't allow a teacher to have a Bible in his office. Yes. Well, on his desk. It on his desk. desk. No, you talk about censorship. Yes, include that. They also. are censoring Christianity out of education. Yes, yes. Uh, and and uh, because of this, the interesting thing is that Eastern Europe, is very prepared, is well prepared to take advantage of their freedom because they're very literate. Mm. They all learn to read. Mm. Uh, in Hungary, in, in mm. East Germany, in the Soviet Union itself, they can read. Take, for example, uh, in Romania, where the reformers, the reformists, Christian reformists, are, uh, have been, were so instrumental in carrying out that revolution, mm -hmm. even though it's been stolen from them by Iliescu. Yet there's an opportunity where a vast population can be instructed in a, a reformed Christianity, simply because they can read, whereby our people, who can't read, they're going to get it all, I suppose, on television, you know. Well, of course. Calvinism restored liberty to Europe. And nobody, uh, hardly anybody, seems to know that outside of the reform community. Well, that's that's true. As a matter of fact, you know that the that it was Calvinism which required biblical literacy. Yes. Which then also required uh, 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 total literacy. But it brought up the rights of man. Well, that, you know, it's interesting. When I was at the library, the Coverley Library, uh, in uh, uh, at Stanford University, I went, went through some of the books and I came across uh, DuPont de Nemours' book, ah, yes. written in 1812 Very interesting on, on national book. education in the United States. And he said in that book, he said, the United States are more advanced in their educational facilities than most countries. They have a large number of primary schools and as their paternal affection protects children from working in the fields, it is possible to send them to the schoolmaster, a condition which does not prevail in Europe. Most young Americans, therefore, can read, write, and cipher. Not more than four in a thousand are unable to write legibly, even neatly. Four in a thousand back in 1812. And he said, England, Holland, the Protestant cantons of Switzerland more nearly approached the standard of the United States because in those countries the Bible is read. It is considered a duty to read it to children, and in that form of religion the sermons and liturgy in the language of the people tend to increase and formulate ideas of responsibility. Controversy also has developed argumentation and has thus given room for the exercise of logic. In America, a great number of people read the Bible, and all the people read a newspaper. The fathers read aloud to their children while breakfast is being prepared, a task which occupies the mother for three quarters of an hour every morning, and as the newspapers of the United States are filled with all sorts of narratives, they disseminate an enormous amount of information. That was education in 1812 when the family was responsible for it, when we had decentralized government, when we didn't have a central education 
agency or bureaucracy telling people what to learn. You see, it was done so beautifully then. Now we come down to the present, and um, in 1989, Education Canada had an article entitled, Johnny Came Back to School But Still Can't Read. And that article says, it is currently estimated that one million Canadians are almost totally illiterate and another four million are termed functionally illiterate. In the United States, these figures are estimated respectively at 26 million and 60 million. Well, look at the contrast. Look at the contrast. We're in a third world condition, culturally yeah. speaking. Oh, absolutely. Yes. We are producing barbarians. Yes. And uh, where it's going to lead to well, as anyone's uh, guess, well, what's going to happen is that the Christians who are learning to read and are teaching their families, they're going to survive. They're going to come out uh, ahead, I believe. Well, it's a new reformation. It's the only, th only possible survival because the only people in the country who have a larger factor in their lives are the Christians. Yes. In that sense. You know, you never hear even the word American anymore. We, uh, I have some fellow told me some years back, at least 40 years ago, he said, I'm Irish. Oh, I said, when did you get here? Oh, he said, I've never been there. I said, then what do you mean you're Irish? Uh -huh. You're born and raised in this country? I said, have you made a lot of trips there? He said, no, I've never been there. I, he, I said, well, why do you call yourself Irish? Well, he said, I've read all the literature. <laughs> I said, that's not the same. Well, that's what is known as multiculturalism, you see. Yeah. Now in America, the schools are playing down such a thing as a, an American model. You are a hyphenated person, yes, you see. Yes. You are an yes. ethnic, you belong yes. to an ethnic group, yes. and what they are doing is fractioning America. Of course. Or fracturing it. They're doing both of it. Ethnic enclaves. Yes. Well, as against uh, what you told the Irishman, let me quote you up. One Scot who was born in Canada told me, he said, everyone tells me because I'm born in Canada. I'm Canadian. But he said, if I were bro born in a garage, would that make me a car? <laughs> he said, I'm a Scot. <laughs> no, he isn't. He's a Canadian. Yes. <laughs> he's a Canadian. He's just dreaming that he's a Scot. Well, tell it to the Quebecois. <laughs> they know who they are. They're French. They're uh, French Canadians. Yeah. Yes, yes. But uh, that's what's happening in our country is this breakup that there is no longer an American model. And part of it also has to do with the decline of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Well, they have become the new minority and the new subject. You, know, you can make all sorts of jokes I know. about the wasp that sure. you can't make about any other group. That's in right. The they're, they're the target. Yes. And uh, Paul Gottfried said to me, he was very surprised at how easily the uh, wasp was pushed off the stage. And I didn't think of it at the moment, but I thought of it later. because He was pushed off the stage because he didn't know there was a war on. That's it. He really took it for granted that everybody that came here would join the American ethos. He but was really not prepared for a network opposition. Well, you know, the, the, the wasp under, undermined himself. They were in mainly behind this genetic movement, the eugenics movement. Yes. And they thought that they could preserve America through eugenics. And they were the ones who were going to keep out all the immigrants, the undesirables. But they did see. No, they didn't. And, that, uh, and of course, they, the interesting thing about American religious life, for example, is that had it remained completely wasp, this nation would be Unitarian. Totally yes, unitary. Well be, yes, but it possible. was the constant influx of immigrants coming into this country with orthodox religion that kept providing numbers who right. were converted to it. The oh, interesting right. thing is the greater majority of Irish in the United States are Presbyterian. Well, they came from Ulster originally. No. No. They came over and the uh, 
immigrant societies that met them at the docks, helped them with housing, helped them with jobs, were various Presbyterian missionary organizations, and they converted them. And uh, one uh, Catholic sociologist who called attention to that uh, fact some years ago said, the Catholics were not interested in their own kind. Not in that sense. No. Well, I will have to come to the defense of the WASP, because by and large they did set up this country. Oh, yes. They did open oh, yes. the gates of this country. To my mind, they are the model. George no, Washington no, is no, the model. No other group of people opened their gates, and none has since. Once they lost their faith, they no longer were t able to turn the immigrants into wasps. Well, that's true. That's and true. But they should get credit. They shouldn't get what they're getting. No. They shouldn't get what they're yeah. getting. No. The descendants of people who came here as refugees have no right to denigrate those who let them in. Absolutely, I agree the, with you. Uh, I read an analysis once of uh, a WASP club that was savagely denounced a few years ago as a highly restrictive <coughs> group. And the ironic fact was that some of the leading members were of such backgrounds as Greek and Jewish. The simple fact was that they had succeeded. They now had become thoroughly Americanized. And the point made was that the term WASP had over the generations absorbed every immigrant. Italians were now WASPs when they were successful and thoroughly oh, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, Americanized. Greeks, Jews, Armenians, all of them. So the term, uh, this writer said, was just a term of abuse. It's become that. Norbert Weiner actually, not Weiner, but uh, I've forgotten now the, the fellow who wrote uh, the book that coined the acronym WASP, uh, The Lonely Crowd, Reisman. Reisman, well, yeah. David Reisman, Reisman. Yeah, David Reisman. Uh, it has become a term of abuse. And yeah. this, of course is part of the alienation of people from one another yes. that you were talking about before, instead of Americans. That's right. Now, when I went to school as, as a youngster from an immigrant family and I saw that picture of George Washington, I aspired, you know, to... I consider the core population everybody who accepts the traditions and history of the country. Yes, sir, there's nothing more precious to me yes. than than the history of this country, the Revolutionary War, the Founding Fathers. I mean, that, that's the glory of America. And for the American education system to deny that, I mean, Patrick Henry isn't even taught anymore in American schools. Well, they, they uh, the, I understand the school administrators uh, will not apply the same rules to all students. Some rules apply, some rules don't apply to everybody. Yes, I mean that's the, that's the beginning of all kinds of breakdowns. Yes. Well, our time is about up. It's been.